Welcome to another amazing show of raising private money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, also your host here on the podcast. And I'm so excited to have my guest here today on the show. As a matter of fact, he had me on his podcast not too long ago. I was so impressed with how such an amazing interviewer he is and so much experience on raising millions of dollars in private money for his deals. So we're going to dive in and ask him, what's his experience? How does he go about locating new private lenders? And how does he get the word out? How does he start conversations with potential private lenders? Well, in addition to that, my special guest, he's had over 30 years of experience in all aspects of real estate, which includes remodeling, building, managing, marketing, and that's both in the space of residential and commercial properties. And you know, with all that experience, he knows what it takes to keep his lenders happy. And don't we want to know about that? Well, his recent projects include residential rehabs, where what he's done is he's added square footage to the uh, properties, fixing obsolete layouts, functional issues, and a unique design were the norm. Well, in addition to that, he is also the founder and general manager of what's called Diversified Capital Partners, uh, which is the uh, real estate development and development company, which specializes in real estate or residential real estate. He also is a uh, partner in the company called Anchor Loans, which actually does loans for new builds, for fix and flips, and they even have a long-term a uh, rental financing program as well. In just a moment, you're going to meet my friend and my special guest, Mr. Rod Wilson. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Conner. Well, before I bring Rod on, I have got a special announcement and a big event that's right around the corner. This is the Private Money Academy Conference. The Private Money Academy Conference, it's going on right here in our local area, Moorhead City, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, and it's October 25, 26, and 27. That's a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, October 25th, 26, and 27. And let me tell you, there's no other event like this on the planet. Listen, on these three jam-packed days, I'm going to be there every day, all day. We're going to dive deep into private money, how to raise private money for your deals, how to locate private lenders. I'm actually going to have private lenders right there at the event for you to network with on the afternoon of the first day. After we spend the first half day on private money, we'll be doing a virtual uh, rehab bus tour. So if you're interested in renovations, we got that covered. And then on the morning of the second day, I'm going to teach you how we find real estate deals before other real estate investors even know about the opportunities. And then on the afternoon of the third day, we're going to, or second day, we're going to be talking uh, about self-directed IRAs and how you can get your deals funded with self-directed IRAs. I'm also going to be teaching how to sell any house in three days or less, even in this market today. So you're never stuck with a house. And then on the third day, it's all about automation. How can you run a multi-million dollar business a year and actually work in it in less Less than 10 hours per week. Here's the best part. In addition to all that, it's a free event. It's valued at $3,000, but before you are, but because you are tuning in right now, it's free with only a $97 registration fee. So you want to get registered at www.jaysliveevent.com. That's J A Y S L I V E. EVENT.com, Jay's Live Event.com. Go right there, get registered, and I look forward to seeing you in person at the Private Money Academy Conference, October 25, 26, and 27. And with that, let's bring on my friend and special guest, Rod Wilson. Hey, Rod, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Jay. I love the energy and uh, I really appreciate the intro. That was probably the best intro um, I, I've heard. 
<laughs> well, that's amazing. And I, I know you've been on a lot of shows as well. So I'm just so glad to have you on. You're an amazing uh, interviewer yourself. In fact, since we're talking about your podcast, let all of our listeners know uh, what your podcast is and how to find you. Yeah, the best way is probably either uh, my website, which is rod-wilson.com. Um, and you could also see it on YouTube and whatever your uh, favorite podcast. Um, uh, it's basically the Optimized Real Estate Podcast. You could search that on YouTube and it'll pop up. Yep. The Optimize, say it again, the Optimized. The optimized Real Estate Podcast. Optimizing estate podcast. your business, yourself, and optimizing real estate values. There you go. A little bit of everything. Well, you've been, you've been in all aspects for a lot of aspects and asset classes of uh, real estate for three decades plus. You've been raising private money for a long time. What did your business look like before you started raising private money way back when? Well, I, I actually, um, met a guy that, that looked at my business. This was very early on because I was basically funding all my deals. I was using bank financing, uh, on the debt side. And then basically all the, the equity or any additional capital ne needed to, to fund and to complete my deals. I was basically doing it all out of pocket. And, um, I had a very smart guy that looked at my business and said, you're basically doing it all. Why are you, you know, doing everything as far as, finding deals, you know, funding deals, putting my name on the dotted line for debt and, um, and then managing them. And so, uh, early on, I, I started looking at using other people's money. Um, and you know, it, it kind of changed my business, not only the amount of deals I was able to do, cause it was, it was huge in that regard because you're very limited when you're using only your own money, even though I was also using debt. And at the time it was pretty low leverage debt. Um, I, you know, just wanted to be in a position where I didn't, you know, maximize leverage and, and get in trouble if, if, you know, things didn't work out perfectly. But the, the, you know, kind of discovery I made at the time is that there was just no need to do it. all. I thought I had to do it all. I thought I, I, you know, who's going to listen to me. I was fairly new in the business, um, new in development. And I just thought I had to do everything myself and found that to be, you know, totally untrue. So let's go back in your memory to when you first started attracting, you first started raising private money. How did you go about it? How did you get the word out? How did you start conversations? You know, that's a great question. And um, I, you know, in thinking back, I, I really kind of fell into um, a few relationships and it seemed like you know, after reading your book, it, it really opened my eyes after all these years on, um, I think a much better approach to take as far as, you know, getting the word out there. Um, but it was literally like a few people that happened to know me and knew what I was doing and, you know, they had interest and, you know, you gotta be, I think you gotta be a little careful with friends and family just cause you know, they can make for some awkward, um, you know, holidays and, and, you know, dinner conversations, I guess. But, um, you know, once you do a good job, you communicate, you, you know, they trust you, then, you know, it gets really easy. It's almost a snowball effect to where you, you've you got almost like, you know, uh, salespeople working for you. They're out kind of telling your story because they're excited about the returns. They're excited about, you know, um, how you operate. Um, it's kind of funny how um, I've, I've also experienced where, and, and at the time I was doing kind of, um, you know, higher end projects, um, you know, very nice, either single family homes. And then I did some apartments that were, you know, kind of signature properties. And it's funny that, you know, they feel like owners as, as investors, they felt like owners and were very proud of what we were doing. And so they wanted to talk about it. So, you know, if I would have had your book, Jay, you know, 20, 30 years ago, it would have been, um, I would have been able to do a lot more deals and raise a lot more money. Cause I'd, I really like some of the strategies that you have. Awesome. Well, what, what are one or two of the strategies that really popped out to you in the book that was sort of like an aha to you? Well, the one that I've actually used a little bit, and it was more for uh, real estate agents to get, you know, to create more deal flow were the luncheons, um, you know, just getting a few people in, um, obviously you're able to to get the message out to more people without, you know, it being overly time consuming. Cause you know, 
you have 10 or 15 people, they're not 10 or 15 separate lunches. They're just one lunch. I think you, you also, um, can leverage the fact that, you know, other people are there, they're, you know, if you got somebody who's afraid to ask a question, you get people that will ask questions and, you know, takes you down another path and gets them more comfortable with, you know, what you're doing. So I think that's a great strategy. Yeah. Well, you know, private lender luncheons have brought in a lot of private money. I mean, just one private lender luncheon alone, I'm thinking about, uh, we, um, we raised $969,000 just at that one private lender luncheon. And, you know, as right. you say, you know, you invite people to lunch, uh, you're going to pay for lunch and you know, you're going to be teaching them. I mean, I tell people all the time, we don't ask for money. We don't chase, you know, we don't beg. I put on literally my teacher hat, my private money teacher hat. <laughs> I love right? it. And I teach people what private money is. I mean, the 47 individual private lenders that we have right now, never heard of private money, never heard of private lending, didn't know what it was. None of them had ever heard of self-directed IRAs. And over half of those 47 people are using their retirement funds. We introduced them to our, uh, to Quest Trust that we recommend all of our private lenders use if they're using retirement funds. And, you know, those private lender luncheons, I'm not pitching a deal uh, specifically. All I'm doing is teaching a program. And, you know, like we talked about on your show, we separate those conversations between teaching the program and then actually having a deal to fund. And Rod, you can probably relate to this. Um, the worst time to be raising money is when you need it for a deal. <laughs> no question. No question. And you, you do a great job of putting that out early on. And uh, I could not agree more. And the, the whole, the, the strategy um, of just not, you know, chasing people. I mean, that was a, that was a big one. I, I have a background in sales and I, if I look at, you know, a lot of that time when I was raising money, I, I did feel like I was chasing and, you know, your attracting model is just, it's spot on. I mean, it's definitely the way you want to do it, especially when you're talking about people's, you know, people's money. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, when we're talking private money, that's different than hard money. Uh, you're a hard money lender. I've got very, very good friends that are hard money lenders. In fact, some of my dear friends who are hard money lenders use my strategies to raise money for their hard money fund. <laughs> <laughs> I bet I, I took a lot out of that book as well. <laughs> and so, um, but here's my advice, uh, bottom line advice at the end of the day, the more relationships that you have in place with private money lenders and traditional lenders, hard money lenders, et cetera, you know, the better off you're going to be, you know, I mean, as we've heard it said many times, your network, right? There's a direct correlation to your net worth. And, um, and you know, before we uh, wrap up the show today, I'm going to want you to talk about your, your uh, hard, money, hard money lending fund that you have as well. But, I mean, go back. I mean, how did you feel, Rod, when you were actually able to break through, raise private money back in the day, and realize that private money was the thing that was really missing in your business? And you started making all that, doing so many more deals. How'd that make you feel walking around with money burning a hole in your pocket? You know, it is, it is one of those things where, you know, it, it's a, it's a shift in mindset and just the confidence of being able to, you know, go after deals and get deals in contract. And, you know, it, it, it went from being a scramble to more. And I, I look at this from, from my experience anyway, is that, you know, I was just kind of winging it at the beginning. And then it, it turned into a real business when I had, you know, capital, I had, you know, even some, some, um, you know, admins and different resources. So growing beyond just kind of a onesie twosie deal at a time to a real, you know, kind of real estate business. I think the, the big thing for me was just the confidence. And so when I was at the offer table or I was talking to a homeowner or a realtor or whatever, it wasn't, you know, this back in your mind going, you know, oh no, how am I going to, how am I going to take this thing down? How am I going to fund it? Exactly. Well, you know, desperation has got a smell to it. <laughs> no question. <laughs> desperation has got a smell. I mean, you know, I practice and I 
advise um, my members in my real estate investing mastermind, my platinum members as well, my private money academy membership. I advise all of them to listen, don't even talk to a new potential private lender that you're, you know, teaching the program to. Don't even bring up a deal that you've got either contract or, or, or you're getting ready to have under contract or that you're negotiating. Because even if you bring that up in the first conversation, you're coming across by not even saying it, but you're communicating, hey, I need funding for this deal, right? So that's why we totally separate, teach the program. They love the program. They're on board of the program. Have they got retirement funds? And we need to introduce them to our Quest Trust Rep out of Houston, Texas. They get their account funded. And now they're actually literally sitting by the phone waiting for you to call them with the good news <laughs> that you right. can now put their money to work in my lands. If they've moved their money over to, uh, you know, Quest, the self-directed IRA company, they're not making any money until you put the money to work for them. In fact, you've got an ethical responsibility to put their money to work for them because they moved it over to their retirement, uh, you know, move their retirement funds over to Quest. So they're waiting for you to put it together. So again, you said it exactly the way I believe it, Rod, a few minutes ago. It all starts with the right mindset here, right? We're not chasing, begging, selling, persuading. We're actually leading and, and, and serving people. I mean, you know, my wife, Carol Joy and I, we have gotten countless thank yous, either in person or handwritten thank you notes as to how we've actually changed people's lives, right? Their retirement years uh, to where they could travel and do all this fun stuff that, whereas otherwise, if they'd had their money just sitting in a CD in the local bank, they sure are not going to live off of that. And so it's all about creating these win, win, win uh, scenarios. Now, one thing that I know you can speak to, Rod, you've borrowed a lot of money, right? You've raised a lot of private money. You are a lender now as well. From your experience, how, how, what's the best advice you can get on how to get the best hard money financing? Uh, great question. Um, and I, I tend to have this, um, Actually, I bring this up a lot because I don't think people really think of, you know, I feel like the world of, of hard money gets so focused on rate and points. I mean, it's it's probably a function of, you know, the advertising, what the average hard money lender does, um, which, you know, is, is fine. I mean, it's important. Obviously, you don't want to pay more than you have to for anything, but there's so many things that come into getting the best financing from your hard money lender. And, you know, most hard money lenders spend, you know, focus primarily on credit and experience. So my advice is always obviously to keep your, you know, your credit score as high as possible. Um, and, you know, I, I actually did a podcast with a, a credit expert and she had some great advice in there, but, you know, some, I'm, I'm always amazed. I mean, I, I can't even say that I really focus that much on my credit. Um, I, you know, I, for, for decades, I had very, very high credit. Um, but it's amazing, like how quickly that can go sideways. I, I went through, um, the, the fun times of the financial meltdown in 08. So, you know, I had some challenges through there that my, my credit took a pretty good hit and it was amazing how long it took to get that back up. So there are, you know, just little things you can do to, to protect your credit. Um, so that's, it's obviously that seems super, um, you know, it's, it's not any uh, groundbreaking uh, advice, but uh, I think, you know, it would help most investors just to focus a little bit on their credit and make sure that their score is super high. Uh, and that it's not just missing payments, but it's also just, you know, how much you're utilizing your available credit that can, uh, you know, keep your credit score low. The second one is the experience. And, um, and again, I, I, I usually tell these stories because I was guilty of, of this, but I'm very surprised at some fairly, you know, established uh, investors, developers that don't have a bio. They don't have a list of past projects. They don't have any details on performance. And I literally, you know, took my own advice, which was, you know, you're busy. It's the last thing you want to do when you're, you know, scrambling to go get, 
either dead or even get, you know, if a, if a private money lender wanted to see what your experience is and your performance and whatnot, um, you know, it's, it's not something, it's not the first thing you want to do, right? You're, you're managing your business, you're chasing deals, you're, you know, doing, uh, projects, construction, whatever is very time consuming. So to sit down and go back through all the HUDs and all the addresses and what'd you buy it for? What'd you put into it? What'd you sell it for? And so I literally, um, for a weekend took like a, I don't even know what you want to call it. Um, a, a working vacation, I guess. And just basically locked myself away with no distractions and focused on I call it telling your story, which includes all the things I mentioned, plus just, you know, the why, why you're doing what you're doing, you know, it, it, I guess, share how much you enjoy it. Um, I think that goes a long way for people to, I mean, really what you're trying to do is, is create trust. And to do that, it, it's, it includes the numbers, but it's also more than just the numbers. So just understanding kind of why you're doing what you're doing and, and even explaining in, in the, um, in the commentary or however you're, you know, you're doing it. I mean, I, I would recommend like a resume slash bio, but even if you're just putting together a list of properties, you know, explaining some of the things you did, meaning how you created value and, and how, you know, you made it a successful deal. Um, as well as just, you know, um, talking about some of the challenges and how you overcame them. I mean, everyone knows real estate isn't perfect and there's going to be challenges. And as a, as an investor, if I'm going to invest with someone, I want to know that, you know, not everything was so rosy because usually if that's the story, it's, it's usually not, you know, the truth or, or at least not completely the truth. And I want to know how they dealt with uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. Well, you're right. I mean, you know, whether it's a private lender or an individual uh, that is looking to invest in your deals or loan you money, or if it's a hard money lender, I mean, if, if you're not credible, if you're not, if you're not telling the truth and telling it like it is, um, I mean, I've heard other people say, say, look, you know, I, I want to hear the ugly stuff too. Right. So, um, you know, tell it like it is. One of your talents, Rod, is knowing and having a lot of experience in maximizing a value in a fix and flip. And we've got a lot of, a, um, a lot of listeners here on the show that do fix and flips. Uh, what are some tips that you can give through your own experience on maximizing value? Um, well, yeah, there's a lot we could talk about there. Um, I actually did a, a podcast with one of the top real estate agents in the, um, in the Bay area, in Los Gatos, Saratoga area. And we, she had a concept that's, that she called check, check all the boxes. And there, there are certain boxes in a, and, and obviously this depends on the, the segment of the market you're focused on. So, you know, it's not going to apply to everything. If you're on the, you know, the low end to the medium, to the, to the high end of the market, obviously there's, there's different things you want to address related to, um, you know, the, the kind of the broader appeal to your buyer. So you got to think about the buyer. Um, but I was primarily in the kind of higher end fix and flip space. And in that space, there are just certain things you had to quote unquote, check the boxes, the certain boxes. And, you know, one of them, um, and, and, and I should probably qualify this. This doesn't apply to, to every deal. Some you want to get, you know, the market's so hot, literally it's paint and carpet and you're out and you're, you know, do very well. So I'm not saying that, that, you know, do this strategy on every deal, but um, most of the ones I did, I, I applied this, um, this practice, which was, um, you know, dealing with some of the functional obsolescence. I mean, you can, you can put the nicest tile and the you know greatest master bath and do whatever, but if the layout is really funky, it's it's going to be hard to maximize the exit. So the functional obsolescence are, are, are a big one. Um, mistakes I see a lot of developers make is it's not finished. And what the way I approached it is, I think I want to have the house be done in a way that the buyer is going to want to come in there in like the next week, they're going to want to have all their friends over for a barbecue. So, you know, a lot of developers will leave the, the landscaping not done or, you know, they don't create outdoor spaces. And, you know, I was in California, so this doesn't apply, you know, across the country, but um, I want to, I want them to not, 
only to be, you know, to feel good and be able to live, you know, move in like the next day. Um, but I also want them to be so proud and so excited that they want to show off, you know, the property to their friends and have, you know, whatever, a barbecue, a party, whatever it is. So um, I, you know, usually would invest a couple bucks in making some outdoor spaces. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, going over the top on landscaping, but for sure the the frontage, you know, I'm always looking to get that money shot um, for the listing. So that would include making sure that, you know, at least the front yard landscape was was pretty dialed in. I um, I, I can't even think of a time where I, I didn't do the backyard as well. Um, but you know, you don't, you don't go over the top. You can go crazy on landscaping and basically, um, you know, spend a lot of money that I don't think you get, you get back. Um, another big one is just looking for, um, opportunities inside, um, a property for, uh, you know, just additional square footage. And one that I've done a lot is taking like hall closets that, and, you know, if it's a house that doesn't have a lot of storage space, you know, you may want to think about, you know, not doing this. But uh, in a lot of cases, I was able to take, you know, either little little niches or, you know, hall closets and make, you know, larger master baths um, and showers. Um, I mean, as you know, in, in some, a lot of the older houses, especially on the West Coast, you know, the master shower back in the you know, whatever 40s, 50s, 60s was very small. And that's just not something, uh, you know, a buyer is going to want these days. So looking for areas that you can, and a lot of them are, are not expensive. Um, you're going to redo the shower anyway. I mean, to pop into a closet and, you know, do a, a little bit of, um, you know, framing and, and um, you know, sheetrock and tile and whatever. I mean, it's, it's not hugely expensive, but man, uh, you know, it can make or break your deal because when someone walks in that master bath and they see how, how tight that shower is. And they, you know, the first thing your the brain does is want to visualize yourself in that thing. And it, it's not, it's not what they want or not what they want to pay for. And so I, I think that's a, that's an area to create some value and some kind of upside on the price. Yeah. You and I have got the same exact philosophy and practice on the landscaping point. Um, when I'm doing a fix and a flip and I'm wanting to get top value uh, in the multiple listing service, um, I always make the, the, uh, the front of the yard, particularly, I mean, like a show place, you know, right now today, my average, like if it's just a regular bread and butter house, it's got, you know, 1200, 1400 square feet, three bed, two bath, you know, I'm going to be investing probably 2,500 bucks in uh, landscaping, which is new landscaping up around the foundation of the, of the front of the house, down the side. Um, you know, fresh mulch going in, color, you know, really making it pop. Well, before we wrap up, Rod, I want you to share with folks about your uh, company, which is called anchorloans.com, anchorloans.com, and um, what that lending arm is all about. Yeah, thanks for asking. Actually, one thing came to mind, Jay, when you were just talking, and um, I, I used to call it my secret weapon and my secret weapon in, in fix and flipping was my wife. And the reason is the reason being she's an interior designer, um, which I do recommend, you know, having someone most, most, uh, and this is just my experience, but most fix and flippers, most contractors, they do, I think they, they, they don't really see the whole vision of a house of an interior and I think that's what a designer brings to the table, as well as in, in the secret weapon part of it is color. I think the biggest miss um, in whether it's ground up construction or fix and flipping that a lot of you know flippers or, or developers will make, the biggest mistake is basically the colors. And they either try to do too much or too little, or they just try to get maybe too creative and use a color that just doesn't work. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a feeling you get when you walk into a house, you want it to be warm and you want it to obviously appeal to a broad audience. Um, and, uh, I think that's just the, the color selection is, is so huge on top of the other things I mentioned. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw it in there. Well, I'm glad you did. Uh, that's another example of how we have the same philosophy. We've had the same interior designer on our team since 2004. Her name is Beth Garner. She chooses all the colors 
and she tells the contractor what to do. Uh, it, it's worth every nickel for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I still stage our houses to the hilt and, and we've, in fact, we got four climate controlled, um, storage units. That's, you know, that's got the staging stuff we've been collecting for years. And, uh, she knows based off of what we have in storage as to the staging she's going to put in there, the pictures and all that, that helps drive some of the color coordinations. But anyway, Go ahead. Tell us about anchor loans. Doctor. Well, and the, the staging is it, and that we can go on and on, but that, that's a huge nugget. And that's a, a huge mistake that, that I see guys making where it's not either not staging every bedroom or not staging the outdoors. So yeah, I, I agree hundred um, percent. Yeah. So getting into anchor loans, anchor loans is a hard money lender focused primarily on fix and flip and ground up construction developers. Um, we focus primarily on one to four family. Uh, the company has been around, you know, 25 years. Um, uh, we're in about, I think it's 48 States today, 47 or 48 States. Uh, so we cover, you know, the whole country. Um, yeah, I mean it, the, the whole, the, the one thing about anchor, cause I've used a lot of hard money in, in the past. And the reason I'm at anchor and like anchor and, and, and think that, you know, we're kind of the best option is just the experience number one. So under this company was built to, um, provide a service to, you know, uh, originally it was ground up construction lenders, I'm sorry, um, developers. And as a developer, obviously you want, you know, the cheapest money you can get, you know, you want to keep your, your cost as low as possible to maximize profits. But the one thing that a lot of people don't really, um, I guess, appreciate until it, you don't get it is just the speed at which they operate, which is, you know, funding on the front end on the purchase. So you're able to write, you know, tighter contracts and, and be more competitive on the, uh, on the offer. Um, you know, the huge one is fund control and I've had absolute nightmare and I won't mention any names, but <laughs> some of our competitors have just been absolute nightmares on, um, dealing with fund control. If you can't get your money and this is, my big pet peeve and actually why I, I like your strategy for, for private money is, you know, I, I can, you know, do my job, meaning, you know, do some, do a fix and flip or a, or a new construction deal, you know, quickly and efficiently and everything else. But if you're, if your money's not there when you need it, I mean, it can really impact obviously your time frame, but then, you know, your cost of overall financing, if it's, you know, every draw takes an extra, you know, few days or weeks to get your money, and you're not able to pay subs and it slows things down. And, and believe me, I have missed the market, um, a couple of times and, you know, looking back, I mean, it was really, I, I mean, I, you can't blame the lender because maybe I should have had more cash to, to keep things rolling, but they made the, the process of getting those, um, the construction holdback funds so painful and so time consuming. I mean, not only was I and my staff spending a lot of time to get them what they needed, but, um, you know, you, you've got subs and, and contractors that have schedules and, you know, if you're either not getting them paid or you're slowing them down, they may have to go jump on another project. And that, you know, couple day delay turns into a couple of weeks. And, you know, we all know what that turns into when, when you're trying to get a product to market. Absolutely. So again, that's www.anchorloans.com. And Rod Wilson is here, my guest on the show today. Rod, thank you so much for joining me and bringing all the value to this amazing podcast. No, I really appreciate it. It was great, Jay. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you, Rod. There you have it, my friend. Another amazing podcast, Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And we really appreciate you being here and tuning in. You make all the difference as to us being able to bring back more amazing guests all the time. So if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and click that bell so you don't miss out on future episodes. If you happen to be listening on iTunes, be sure and follow me, uh, Spotify as well. And so we're looking forward to seeing you right here on the very next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r dot com slash money guide 
and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnorcom slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.